Doctor in this artwork represents a mental health professional who is helping the patient to rise above her difficulties. The dove on her sleeve symbolizes the hope and healing that comes with mental health treatment, while the healing heart on the patient's sleeve represents their progress towards recovery. The plants surrounding the picture are a symbol of growth and new life. They suggest that with the doctor's help, the patient can overcome her difficulties and move forward. The doctor grows as well with the knowledge and skills she acquired from their therapeutic relationship. This relationship is one that goes beyond borders, as depicted by the illustration of the earth in the background. This further emphasizes that mental health struggles are not just isolated to any one individual or group, but are also complex societal problems that require attention and action on a larger scale. Overall, this artwork offers hope and inspiration to those who may be struggling. This highlights the importance of seeking out mental health treatment and support when needed, wherever they may be in this world. This is also a call to action for society to prioritize mental health and work towards creating a more supportive and inclusive environment for all individuals. By recognizing mental health struggles as societal problems, we can work towards creating a more compassionate and just world for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Santos. And I think that's a very good uh, way to start our discussion for tonight. Of course, our artwork ties up with the case that we have. And so to hear the case, we'd like to now call on uh, Dr. Uh, Paula Kidlat for our case uh, vignette. Dr. Kidlat. Good evening, everyone. Today, I will be presenting the case of E.B., a 29-year-old female Filipino married Roman Catholic BS Tourism College graduate currently residing and working as a bartender in Belgium. She was brought to the emergency room. According to her brother, nagwawala na po kasi siya. And according to her, I'm just here for my mother's medical checkup. Seven months prior to admission, the patient was noted by her family to be having grandiose delusions that she was Jose Rizal and nihilistic delusions that the end of the world was coming for her friends and family in the Philippines. According to the patient, she claimed that she was just worried for her family in the Philippines. However, her husband would claim that everything was all right which the family increasingly doubted. The family's friends in Belgium investigated and found that she was also becoming increasingly paranoid at work, with occasional episodes of agitation causing her to be video recorded by her colleagues during such episodes. The patient's family then asked the patient to come home earlier than her planned vacation. In the interim, no consults were done nor medications were taken. Two months prior to admission, she came home to the Philippines with her husband. She was noted to have mood lability, increased energy, grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, talkativeness, flight of ideas, and psychomotor agitation, along with hallucinatory gestures of talking to herself, paranoid delusions that her family members had evil spirits inside them that were trying to make them harm her, and nihilistic delusions that she was responsible for the death of Fidel V. Ramos or the eruption of the Taal Volcano. This prompted consult at the local hospital in Paranaque, where the patient was admitted for five days as a case of to consider schizophreniform disorder and started on risperidone 1 mg, which rapidly improved her symptoms. However, the husband opted for home against medical advice due to financial constraints. In the interim, she was non-adherent to her medications due to the husband's refusal to to believe she was ill. The family reported the husband to Rafi Tulfo in action due to alleged maltreatment by her husband, who then brought in their own psychiatrist and wanted to perform a drug test on the patient and her husband. It was at this point that the husband left the country without notice. She continued to present with the aforementioned symptoms until a few hours prior to admission, she had an argument with her brother regarding her desire to procure a home. It was at this point that she was described as nagwawala, shouting at her brother and threatening to report them to the condo security. Her brother and mother decided to bring her to PGH for consult, under the pretense that it was her mother who needed a checkup for her hypertension. The ancillary history are non-contributory to this case.
On anamnesis, EB is the youngest of three children born full term by normal spontaneous delivery with no known fetal maternal complications. Her parents were entrepreneurs managing their seafood business and ready to wear clothes shop. She had a good relationship with her mother but had a poor relationship with her father who was notably physically abusive. She denied having any developmental delays. She was an outstanding student graduating cum laude from her class. She met her Belgian husband via an online dating website and married him after two years of long-distance relationship. She was then brought to Belgium five years prior where they initially had a good relationship, though was notably not supported by her family as they preferred to have her stay in the Philippines. The initial mental status examination at the emergency room is as follows. The patient is an adult Filipino female of long brown hair, fair complexion, plump build, and average stature. She was seen standing well kept, dressed appropriately for age and occasion. She was calm but uncooperative, conversant with good eye contact. No psychomotor retardation or agitation noted. Speech was hyperproductive, pressured, with clear articulation and rising volume. Mood was labile, shifting from euthymia to dysphoria to irritability, with broad congruent affect, with prominent paranoid and grandiose delusions, preoccupied with being brought in by her family without her consent. Thought process was circumstantial, tangential, and with looseness of association. Denied hallucinations, no hallucinatory gestures elicited. She was oriented to person, place, and time, but with poor insight, denies that she is ill. While at the emergency room, she had episodes of agitation after learning about her admission for non-adherence to medical treatment and threats to harm others. Her mother and brother signed the consent for admission. The ER officer then received calls via the PGH landline that her alleged husband was threatening to sue the hospital for illegally detaining his wife. The case was then elevated to the senior house officer, the consultant on duty, who was also our department chair, and the head of patient services. It was decided that the patient be admitted due to non-adherence to medical treatment and high risk for harm to self and others. Admission was facilitated with a consent form signed by the patient's mother. The case was to be raised to the PGH legal office once it, op once it opened on the next business day. She was then admitted at PGH Ward 7. Verbal consent was provided for by the patient herself. Laboratory tests were facilitated and yielded unremarkable results. Medications started were olanzapine 10 mg per tab, one tab at bedtime, and cell phone privileges were deferred. I, the resident in charge, together with the senior resident on duty, conversed with the patient's husband through Viper voice call at the time. The contact number was provided for the by the patient herself, and the identity of the husband was corroborated through pictures shown by the patient herself. Indications for admission were explained to the husband, but he still demanded for his wife to be released from the hospital. The case was then raised to PGH legal office, whereby the healthcare team was advised to discontinue any further correspondence with the patient's husband until he has proven his identity and relationship with the patient. A letter addressed to her husband was sent to him stipulating these conditions. However, he was unable pro to provide such documentation. As for the patient, olanzapine 10 mg per tab was eventually increased to 1.5 dabs at bedtime. With the current dose, there was a decrease in manic and psychotic symptoms. She was then eventually discharged with good control of manic and psychotic symptoms. Prior to discharge, a family meeting was conducted where long-term treatment plans were discussed. After discharge, the patient stayed in the Philippines for three months prior to returning to Belgium. She was on regular OPD follow-ups with me, her OPD resident in charge, and had good adherence to medications. There was no recurrence of the manic or psychotic symptoms. Upon return to Belgium, the patient brought with her four months' worth of medications. Since she had initial difficulties booking an appointment with a local psychiatrist in Belgium, she still followed up with me via telemedicine for the first three months. She also raised concerns regarding the language barrier. On her fourth month in Belgium, as her medications were about to run out, she was finally able to book a schedule with a psychologist and then eventually with a psychiatrist in a different city further away from her residence. She was advised by the psychiatrist to observe herself for now 
no medications were prescribed and she was scheduled for another follow-up psychiatrist. Her latest mental status the brown hair, fair complexion, plump build seen by video call. She was well-kept, dressed appropriately for age and occasion. She was calm, calm, make broad congruent aspect. The process was near substantial than just producing the night in the stations. She was her person and had fair insight to illness. Thank you very much. So, in case, uh, uh, as we were presenting it here tonight, and uh, before we go to our discussion, we'd like to engage all of you, um, knowing the topic for me, we'd like to hear your thoughts. Recording in so, progress. Let me read through it and uh, we'll be showing the results in a while before we head to the discussion. So, first question Have you ever admitted a patient without their consent, but with the family's consent? Yes or no? I think most of us here in the audience are psychiatrists, and um, I have a guess uh, what would be the answer of most people here, but uh, let's see, right? Um, number two, have you ever referred a patient to the hospital's legal department, to your institution's legal department? Um, yes or no? And then lastly, do you see Filipino patients who are physically uh, residing in another country via telepsychiatry or maybe vice versa? Maybe you had a patient in the Philippines and you were abroad for a while or uh, for a certain period of time, or maybe you're residing abroad already and, and you're seeing patients uh, in from the Philippines. And so uh, have you encountered this kind of situation? Yes or, or no? So it will be interesting to see uh, our answers here. Um, Basically, we just want to highlight specifically these uh, scenarios that we've heard from the case, uh, these issues that we'll actually be discussing. And uh, by now, you have an idea what our resource speakers will probably be highlighting in their presentations. And so if you also have some questions already in your head, we'd like to um request you to write them. And we have a Q&A box here. So even as uh, our discussants will uh, still be discussing their uh, presentation, feel free to already type your questions there and we hope to answer each one of them later on. Okay, so I, I believe all of us have uh, been uh, able to uh, answer the poll already or you've, have, you've had the time to answer it. So we'd like to request our sponsor now, our tech team, to flash the answers of our participants uh, for our poll. We've had three questions. And uh, yeah, I think you can see it in your screens now. So for the first question, have you ever admitted a patient without their consent, but with the family's consent? 88% or 99 out of the 113 who have answered this question among our participants here answered yes. So 88% said yes. For the second question, have you ever referred a patient to the hospital's legal department? Oh, this is uh, interesting. 
that actually close to 30%, to be exact, 29%, or 33 out of 113 said yes. Um, I assume that we hypothesize that this will really be lower, but uh, this is still a good number. So maybe we'll have an interesting discussion later on. And lastly, uh, do you see Filipino patients or physically in another country via telepsychiatry or vice versa? 26% answered yes. So 29 out of the 113 participants. So thank you very much. We appreciate your participation. And I think uh, this is really good data already that we have uh, for our discussion. And so let me not... uh, a delay things anymore. We'd like now to welcome our main discussant, our uh, student and teacher in bioethics as well, uh, one of our consultants and a good friend, uh, Dr. Carrasco, for the discussion of our case tonight. Okay, good evening, everybody. So let's go on into the discussion uh, of the topic at hand, ethics and the law in psychiatry. Challenges for patient care. So several issues can be identified in the case discussed by our resident, Dr. Kidlat. So next slide, please. These are the out these are the topics that we'll be discussing for the next few minutes. Next slide. So as we mentioned earlier, as you have also answered in our poll, uh, we have determined several issues. Uh, in the case, the first of which would be uh, the issue of involuntary treatment. And this issue can be viewed through several lenses. I'd first like to go through the uh, view or the lens of ethics of care, which may be a bit new to us because we're all probably more familiar with Principalism, which will, I, I will also discuss later. But I'd like to highlight this because uh, as psychiatrists, we are called into situations in the emergency department or other clinical settings, and we are tasked to make decisions such as when to advise interventions such as involuntary treatment. So in this case, as I mentioned, we did have that uh, specific issue arise. When viewing involuntary treatment through the lens of ethics of care, we need to understand what ethics of care actually is first. So ethics of care or care ethics is a normative ethical theory that holds that moral action centers on interpersonal relationships, meaning more value is placed on um, how you relate to other people. Uh, According to its proponent, Carol Gilligan, it is an ethic grounded in voice and relationships in the importance of everyone having a voice, being listened to carefully in their own right and on their own terms, and heard with respect. Block and Green in 2006 also posited that ethics of care contributes to a climate of trust in our relationships with others. And the effort to improve a climate of trust is the primary moral activity, the one vital component. Specific to us as psychiatrists, it can be likened to our therapeutic alliance. So in the case of EB, the psychiatrist was tasked to bring to the patient and her family compassion and sensitivity, meaning to extend care to the whole group. And the moral task at hand was to present a willingness to empathize with the anguished parties and the effort to imagine what each of them is experiencing, which is part of the virtuous process of contributing to a climate of trust. So we may say that involuntary treatment was actually the solution that was arrived at in order to uh, bring about Um, compassion and sensitivity at the time. If we look at involuntary treatment through the lens of principalism, which was popularized or proposed by uh, Beecham and Childress, the principles of respect for autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, we can note that in this particular case, a paternalistic action for the benefit of the patient was done, the involuntary treatment. 
because it was to ensure that the patient will be cared for and that no harm will come to her. So we need to ask then, um, which is also the critique for principalism, when do you uphold one principle over another? When is it important to do that? So the questions of whether the patient's autonomy was respected and was justice um, upheld is very important. At this point in time, we can see that um, intervention in the case was clinically indicated and it was likely to bring the most benefit at the time. So there are reasons to believe that the patient's significant mental illness processes were distorting her ability to formulate or express sustained authentic wishes. And not intervening may have grave consequences and even bring about irreversible harm. This approach does not diminish the, the autonomy of the individual or disregard justice, but rather acknowledges forces that may be interfering with her genuine autonomy and provides treatment that will have been provided to anyone else in her situation. So I think this discussion brings about another framework. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, very simple one. Uh, proposed by Lolas in 2006, wherein we can ask some questions when we are trying to arrive at solutions to ethical dilemmas. So for, for Lolas, he, he noted that any intervention, if considered in the context of bioethics, should fulfill at least three conditions. First, it should be appropriate to the problem at hand. Second, it should be good in the sense that it does good to those who receive it, but also to those who perform it. And third, it should be just in the sense that its outcomes can be generalized to the whole of society. So these are the questions that we can ask when we are faced with, with a similar case. For the case of EB, again, these are the questions that was asked. And as mentioned earlier, uh, the involuntary treatment was found to have been morally acceptable. Next slide, please. And as the case developed, we, we uh, noted that eventually our patient provided consent, uh, though it was verbal consent at the time, and upheld that consent by continuing her uh, follow-up after her inpatient care through uh, her follow-up with her resident um, physician, her, with Dr. Kidlat. And even continuing uh, her follow-up when uh, as she went back to Belgium, her, her place of work. This actually gives us an introduction to what we would now uh, recognize as a very common and um, arising um, issue in global psychiatry or global mental health. So as we said earlier, this now the second issue identified in the case is the practice of intercountry telepsychiatry or telemedicine. So in the era of global mental health, which according to the American Psychiatric Organization involves the study, research, and practice of improving mental health for all people worldwide, cases such as these have been becoming more and more prevalent. So cats and her colleagues in 2014 proposed these five steps to resolve an ethical dilemma in global psychiatry. So if we are faced with a similar situation, this is a possible approach that we can take. The steps include gathering information, identification of ethical issues, which we would need to assess for uh, ethical implications specific to global psychiatry, which we will go on in more detail later, and assess for effects on autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice, and assess from the different schools of thought in ethics. And then we arrive at the decision-making, negotiation, and their proposal is to convert uh, this process into scholarly communication mostly because global psychiatry is an emerging field and we are in need of a lot of um, studies and, as mentioned, scholarly communication to further develop the field. Next slide, please. 
So they believe that global psychiatry stands apart from other areas of healthcare when it comes to ethical considerations because of the following. The first is the reality that there is a paucity of resources to enable and support psychiatric care abroad and a greater demand for psychiatric healthcare professionals relative to other fields of medicine. And we all know that that's a reality that we face every day with the long line of um, consultations that we have, referrals from everywhere. And we have seen the upsurge, especially uh, with the pandemic and after, and now that the WHO has uh, officially declared that the emergency period for the pandemic has passed, we are still seeing that our services are needed at this point in time. We also need to consider that longitudinal treatment is usually necessary for successful psychiatric care, as was seen in our case. And the nature of our treatment uh, is that we inherently place more emphasis on care rather than cure. We know that most of our patients would need long-term care in order to uh, set them on their way to recovery. We also note that the effects of mental illness are often intangible, but very important and um, salient in their effect on functionality. We also need to um, mention that language barriers are more imposing on psychiatry than on other areas of healthcare and that culture, spirituality, and other belief systems have an effect on psychological mindedness. So for some notes on the law, uh, let's get to the next slide, please. We can take note of some of the provisions of the mental health, care, uh, mental health law of the Philippines, such as the exceptions to informed consent. For example, in our case, um, we uh, used uh, the order of the mental health professional as basis for the involuntary treatment. Next slide, please. And lastly, uh, again, if there is no legal representative, then these are the provisions that will give us guidance as to who will be able to provide consent in place of our patient. So in the case presented, mental health, the mental health professional at the emergency department deemed the patient incapable of providing informed consent to treatment due to the impaired reality testing upon assessment. So her mother and brother signed consent form for admission and husband was not present at the ER. So the patient verbally consented to treatment when she came to the ward and upon clinical improvement, again, she signified continued consent to treatment and engagement and follow-up. So th these are just some guidelines that we can use uh, in our clinical practice if we ever do encounter uh, similar cases. And generally, ethical um, analysis is really not, provide, not about providing clear-cut answers, but arriving at solutions to dilemmas through analysis through consideration, and at this point in time, you know, gathering a lot of information and giving a lot of thought into our uh, clinical solution. So that's it for my um, discussion. Thank you very much. Back to you, Dr. Kirin. Thank you very much, Dr. Carrasco, for that um a uh, very good discussion, and I believe that uh, uh, the interest of our audience uh, has been picked. And uh, we actually have uh, one question already in our Q&A box, and uh, I hope there will be more <laughs> to come. But at this point, we'd like to hear the reaction of our two other resource uh, speakers. So we'd like to hear first from Attorney uh, Shella Marie Beltran for her reaction on the law in psychiatry. Attorney Beltran, we give now the Zoom floor to you. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening. everyone. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, 
So I'll be actually, this, the specific topics that I will be uh, discussing tonight pertains to, uh, pertain to telemedicine uh, and, and, uh, and informed consent and uh, the apostille. So um, we'll uh, start now. Um, next slide, please. So telemedicine, while this is not a new uh, concept, uh, it became significant during the COVID-19 pandemic. So what is telemedicine? It refers to the delivery of healthcare services where distance is a critical factor by all healthcare professionals using information and communication technologies for the exchange of valid information for diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease and injuries, research and evaluation, and for the continuing education of healthcare providers, all in the interest of advancing the health of individuals and their communities. So with the advancement of uh, communication technologies and the uh, global um, mental health and the need for a global awareness, uh, specifically on mental health, um, this uh, become, uh, becomes paramount, the, the uh, use of telemedicine. So next slide, please. While there is no specific law in the Philippines um, addressing telemedicine per se, um, there are certain there are legal bases for it. And one of it, the first and foremost of it, is our fundamental law, the 1987 Constitution, wherein, um, in Article One, stating the state policies, the state recognizes no, the right to health of the people and still health consciousness among them. Likewise, uh, the Universal Health Care Act, Republic Act Number no. One One Two Two Three, um, it uh, provides for uh, the um, one of the uh, purposes of the uh, the act or the law is to ensure that all Filipinos are guaranteed equitable access to quality and affordable health care goods and services and protected against financial risk. And uh, in uh, May 20, 2021. The Department of uh, Health specifically issued, issued specifically a circular for uh, the guidelines. This is Memorandum Circular Number 2021-00225, which actually is uh, the guidelines in the implementation of telemedicine in the delivery of individual-based health services. So um, uh, we will uh, discuss no, the um, uh, specifically the uh, different methods of telemedicine. Next slide, please. So these are synchronous tele telemedicine and asynchronous telemedicine. So synchronous refers to uh, real-time telephone or live audio video communication that connects physicians and patients in different locations via smartphones, tablet, or computer. Uh, in this uh, kind of modality, the involved individuals are simultaneously present for the immediate exchange of information, as in the case of video conferencing. While asynchronous telemedicine refers to store and forward technologies where messages, images, or data are collected at one point in time and interpreted or responded to later. It also includes remote patient monitoring or direct transmission of a patient's clinical measurements from a distance to their healthcare provider. So these are the methods of telemedicine. Next slide, please. So the memorandum circular uh, issued by the DOH um, provides specific guidelines in telemedicine. So um, we will discuss that one by one. So the first of this is only licensed physicians shall be allowed to practice telemedicine. So this is very clear. And um, under RA number 2380 or the Medical Act of 1959, um, the, uh, the standards of practice of medicine uh, as, in, as defined in the said law must be followed. And uh, likewise, the, uh, the physicians who will um, involve in telemedicine services should, uh, should uphold the same standards of care as in a face-to-face -face consultation. So I'm sure you all know 
um, the Medical Act of 1959, uh, RA number 2382, Section 10 uh, of said law specifically defines what is a practice of medicine. And uh, second guideline would be all licensed physicians shall exercise their professional judgment to decide whether the use of telemedicine is appropriate in a given situation and the specific condition of the individual patient. So um, the uh, question that will be asked here is, will telemed telemedicine uh, be the best, you know, is the best for um, the patient? Uh, um, we always you know, we always um, recognize this, you know, that face-to-face um, -face consultation is the ideal um, way you know, to uh, um, look after patients. And uh, telemedicine should not be used as a convenient tool. So you have to um, exercise now your professional judgment, taking into consideration you know, different uh, factors. Of course, number one would be the location or the, uh, um, the, um, uh, the uh, um, condition also of the patient. So uh, you have to uh, take note of that. Okay, number three, next slide, please. The practice of telemedicine by li licensed physicians shall be governed by the following principles. So the patient-physician relationship shall be founded on mutual trust and respect in which they both identify themselves reliably during telemedicine consultation. And uh, telemedicine consultation should not be anonymous. Uh, uh, both the patient and the physician must be identified. Um, and both the patient and the licensed physician should be able to know, verify, and confirm each other's identity at the start of the telemedicine consultation. So what, what do we uh, get from here? Uh, no proxy uh, consultation. I mean, um, the, uh, nobody should stand you know, on behalf of the patient likewise with the, uh, the uh, physician, licensed physician. B, uh, proper informed consent must be obtained from the patient prior to any collection of personal data and the offering of any telemedicine service, regardless if it is a first-time consultation or a follow-up consultation. So later on, I will discuss um, at length uh, what is an informed consent. The patient a physician relationship shall be on full knowledge of the patient's medical history and a physical examination given the circumstances of a lack of a physical contact. So if it's very important that we have full knowledge of the condition of the patient you know, to be able to give the um, proper um, advice and um, management to the patient. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The patient-physician relationship shall respect both patient and physician um, autonomy. So what do we mean by this? So the licensed physician can choose not to proceed with the telemedicine at any time as guided by both law and ethics. So, and I, in the same manner, the patient no, at any stage has the right to choose to discontinue the telemedicine consultation. So both of these must be um, uh, respected, you know, the autonomy to uh, continue with the telemedicine. Um, nobody can, uh, neither the patient nor the physician should be held you know, um, uh, against, you know, or should continue with the telemedicine against uh, uh, their will. Letter E, the right to privacy of health information shall be protected at all times. So this is very uh, important, especially with the uh, um, enactment of the Data Privacy Act of 2012. So all licensed physicians providing telemedicine services shall uphold the privacy rights of patients and shall provide the mechanisms for the patients for the effective exercise of these rights. And um, the physicians should also um, have um, data and privacy um, requirements. Make sure that you have a system that would protect all um, records you know, or personal information 
and uh, other um, uh, information um, of the patient. Make sure that these are all protected because any breach of that um, obligation to protect this private, the, the information, you may be liable for data, uh, for um, violation of Data Privacy Act of 2012. And um, uh, it is very uh, easy you know, for a patient to just file a complaint with the National um, uh, Commission, in, um, Privacy Commission. And uh, you will be, once a complaint is filed against you for breach of personal uh, information, um, you will be uh, uh, required to explain. And uh, the, um, uh, that is already considered a, uh, a case no, against you. So uh, we have to be very careful in um, handling personal information of the patient. Next slide, please. So the principle of privilege communication between the license, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so the privilege of communication between the licensed uh, physician and the patient shall be obs observed at all times. So what do we mean by this? So all, all video or audio recording of the telemedicine consultation without the consent of both licensed physician and the patient shall not be allowed. And the protection of privileged communication between the licensed physician and patients shall be adhered at all times. So just an, um, an added information now, when we say um, privileged communication between the licensed physician and the patient, this uh, is in a, a um, um, a situation where a physician who gets information while professionally attending to a patient cannot, in a civil case, be examined without the patient's consent as to any facts which would blacken the latter's uh, inter, uh, reputation. So take note of this. Privileged communication is applicable only in uh, when this, uh, when the information was uh, obtained professionally and in civil cases. So in criminal cases, this privileged communication cannot be used as a def or, or as a, a reason, especially so when um, you are issued a subpoena, ducis tecum and a testificando by the court. Uh, what are examples of civil cases wherein you may invoke uh, the, this uh, privileged communication. One is pertaining to custody, wherein uh, the uh, mental capacity or incapacity of your patient may be a, uh, the ground for um, uh, uh, removing the custody of uh, children. Um, and also in cases of uh, declaration of nullity of marriage, especially when the ground is psychological incapacity, in also cases of guardianship. So um, you may invoke this uh, privileged communication um, uh, and uh, you will not be, you, you will not uh, be compelled to testify without the consent of the patient, okay? So um, next slide, please. We will now go to right to inform consent. So what, uh, this is one of the rights now of a patient. So the patient has a right to a clear, truthful, and substantial explanation in a manner and language understandable to the patient of all proposed procedures, whether diagnostic, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, or therapeutic, wherein the person who will perform the said procedure shall provide his name and credentials to the patient, possibilities of any risk of mortality or serious side effects, problems related to recuperation and probability of success and reasonable risk involved. So what are the elements of an informed consent? So there are four elements. Next slide, please. These are capacity, voluntariness, knowledge, and decision-making. So when we say capacity, this is the ability you know, to understand the nature of treatment and the consequences of um, the consequences of said treatment. So um, Voluntariness is indicated by the willingness to undergo treatment, no um, force, 
no um, vitiated consent or uh, the, um, the, the patient will not be forced to undergo treatment for, uh, against his or her will. And knowledge means that sufficient information has been given to the patients to understand the nature and consequences of the treatment. So it, it involves making the patient and family members aware of their condition, the proposed treatment, and the risks and benefits of the proposed treatment, the available alternatives, and their risks and benefits. And lastly is the decision-making means the ability to take decisions. So all in all, informed consent when we say, um, when we um, have to ask now for the consent of the uh, patient, all these four elements must be present. All these four elements now. Um, and um, so, My apologies. Okay, next slide, please. So the right to informed consent, the general rule is a patient will not be subjected to any procedure without a written informed consent. So um, it is very important you know, that the consent be written. Uh, this is also uh, significant you know, in cases where the patient or um, any of his or her family member would file a case against the uh, physician or the hospital. And um, we are courts of, uh, we are courts of uh, records. So the best evidence to prove the consent would be a written informed consent. An exception here, it would be in emergency cases where the patient is at imminent risk of physical injury or death if treatment is withheld or postponed. So in these cases, um, the consent of the uh, patient need not be um, secured. Number two, when the health of the population is dependent on the adoption of a mass health program to control epidemic. Next slide, please. When the law makes it compulsory for everyone to submit a procedure. Number four, when the patient is either a minor or legally incompetent, in which case a third party consent is required. Um, who are these legally incompetent patients? So um, the civil code provides for this. They are um, insane persons, demented persons, or deaf mutes who do not know how to write. So these are the legally incompetent uh, patients now. Number five, when disclosure of material, material information to patient will jeopardize the success of treatment, in which case third party disclosure and consent shall be in order. And number six, so remember, right to inform consent is one of the rights of a patient. And as a right, the patient may waive it. So, and uh, very important also that the waiver must be in writing with the full understanding of the consequences of uh, no such waiver. Next slide, please. Now let's go. To whom should uh, we obtain an informed consent? First, number one, the patient concerned, if he is of legal age and of sound mind. But if the patient is incapable of giving consent and a third party consent is required, the following persons may give consent. So this is in order. Number one, the spouse. So when we say spouse, dapat ano po to, legal spouse, validly married. No? There must be a valid marriage between the parties, the, the, the spouses. Number two, son or daughter of legal age, either parent, brother or sister of legal age, or guardian. Next slide, please. If a patient is a minor, Consent shall be obtained from his parents or legal guardian. However, if the next of kin or the parents or the legal guardians refuse to give consent to a medical or surgical procedure necessary to save the life or limb of a minor, the courts, no, upon the petition of the physician or any person interested in the welfare of the patient, may issue an order giving consent. So this is a summary proceedings. However, the challenge here is... Uh, 
since you still have to go to court no, and file the petition, this may take time. This may take time. So um, next slide, please. Okay. So I just included this apostille because um, um, like the case now of Evie where she is residing in a, where she works in Belgium and she was admitted here. And uh, the legal office of uh, PGH recommended the, um, uh, the, the husband who is, a worker, who is living in Belgium has to uh, prove his uh, relationship with uh, the patient <clears throat> through a valid marriage contract. And since the document will be coming from another country and to be used here in the Philippines, what is uh, the legal office said that the document must be duly apostilled. So what is this apostille? This is a certification that authenticates the origin of the doc document and not the contents for which the document was issued. So in effect, the apostille certifies the authenticity of the signature or seal of the person or authority that signed or sealed the public document. So this actually um, replaces the uh, red ribbon no, that we usually secure from the TFA. Now, uh, the apostille um, is um, uh, the apostille convention. Not all countries in the world are parties no, to uh, the apostille. So it is very important to determine first if the country where the uh, document will be coming from is a member you know, of the Apostille Convention. So like in the case, in the, in the present case, Belgium is a party to the Apostille Convention. So the, um, the, the husband, if ever uh, he has to comply with the requirements, no, uh, will have to uh, have the document um, coming from Belgium that he will execute, which should be duly Apostille. Okay. Next slide, please. So the term public document you now for purposes of uh, the uh, Hague Apostille Convention, these are documents eman emanating from an authority or official connected with the courts or tribunals of the state. And uh, number two, administrative documents, notarial acts, official certificates, placed on documents signed by persons in their private capacity, such as official certificates like recording the registration of a document or its existence on a certain date on official and notarial authentication of signatures. So I have here actually a sample of apostille. Um, this uh, came from uh, the state of California. So this is what the apostille looks like. So the document that was uh, executed by my client here is a special power of attorney. Uh, for to in, to file a case here in the Philippines, so but uh, so this is actually what an apostille looks like. Next slide. I think that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Attorney Beltran. Uh, uh, that was a comprehensive discussion, and uh, we've seen actually uh, a few more questions in our Q and A box, and so I think uh, we already have a. Uh, good data for discussion later. Uh, but we'll hear first from Dr. De La Liana, uh, her reactions to the case, particularly focusing on OFW mental health. So let's uh, all welcome and listen to Dr. De La Liana. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kirin. Good evening, everybody. So, um, yeah, we're going to be talking about how the government and how even some psychiatrists have been able to support the OFW mental health. So next slide, please. So as a, so as a resident and as a, career, as a well, previous psychiatry resident and, and as somebody who is currently practicing in both private and public institutions, uh, looking after OFWs or migrants, migrant workers is not very new to me and actually not very new to a lot of us here. But I'll be honest, before tonight, I did not know as much about it. It was very 
individualized and only for the patients I actually had and the patients I actually look after. So after listening to this case and listening to Dr. Carrasco and Dr. Beltran and, and Attorney Beltran, I actually came upon this study. So it was published in 2020. It concerns a policy analysis on the mental health needs of overseas Filipino workers, addressing gaps through evidence-based policy reform. So what they did for this study was to do a review of what laws and programs are being enacted for the mental health of our overseas Filipino workers. And also they held a roundtable discussion with the stakeholders in order to find out a little more about said topic. So next slide, please. So apparently, looking after migrants, looking after Filipino migrants takes place even before they actually leave the country. So one is the pre-qualification process where the Filipinos are strengthened that way because there is such a thing as a comprehensive pre-departure education program where there are seminars and workshops about migrating, about uh, transacting with the embassy, and even about how to take care of their mental health, uh, uh, acculturation difficulties, and some even discuss the language barrier after you, after you migrate overseas. So ideally, ideally, psychometric testing could be done to also determine the, the Filipino's quote-unquote fitness for migrating. However, the current uh, psychometric testing that we have, of course, they're not as sensitive, and of course, there's no guarantee of who is uh, going to be a good migrant or who will not have problems. Because even while the migrant worker is okay while before deployment, a lot of things can happen in their new lives abroad. So, of course. Uh, that can also pave the way for poor mental health. Okay, so what else? It's also important to make sure that our welfare desk officers and recruitment agencies, both uh, public and private, are competent enough to prepare departing OFWs and to even handle mental health problems that crop up later on. So this is especially for those Philippine embassy or consulate group employees and staff members who will be receiving said employees in the host countries. What else? It's also very important to strengthen the civil registry process to protect minors from trafficking. Because uh, in some provinces, it's, it is known that not all birth certificates are filed or not all births are registered immediately after birth. So that's actually a very easy way to take the year of birth of an individual. So they could be minors and they could already be going abroad and migrating as adult employees. Okay, next slide, please. So, finished na yung, yung pre-deployment activities to prepare the Filipino migrant workers. So when they get there, it's very, when they get to their host country, when they start working, it's very important to create and sustain supportive mechanisms for them. So we should be able to have supportive, decent, and humane living and working conditions for the OFWs. That's why we maintain good relationships with the other countries, with the host countries, in order to make sure that the contracts are being followed and that they are protected to the extent of the loss of to the loss and the agreements that both countries are part of. And it's also very important to maintain communication with their families who have been left behind. So also, during deployment, embassy staff who are pretty much our frontliners, if there are problems with our OFWs abroad, they should also be given their, besides their capacity to handle mental health issues of the OFWs, they should also be given support of their own. Because uh, we know this very well, especially with the current mental health boom that's been happening, who cares for the carers? So the embassy staff should be 
prepared for as well. So next slide, please. This part is actually interesting. We all know that the world over, there is not quite there are not quite enough mental health workers, there are not quite enough mental health specialists anywhere. So can you imagine what kind of access migrant workers have in a country that is not their own? They are not necessarily insured. Their employers are not necessarily supportive. They might not even speak the same language, so they're not, they might not even be comfortable. And they are afraid to come for help because their contracts might be terminated. So one of the, one of the solutions that are proposed actually is this. It is, an, it is a free app called Kamusta Kabayan. It was piloted among Filipina migrant workers in Macau, I believe. So you can download it in the Play Store or in the App Store. And it contains activities that will help the migrant worker take care of themselves. So yeah. Next slide, please. So we also move on to online counseling or online support or for us psychiatrists, telepsychiatry or telemedicine. What does, uh, what does uh, the PPA say about telepsychiatry during the pandemic? So this is, I believe, a 2020 document. So uh, it's very hard to read the small font, so I will do it for us. Who can practice telemedicine? Any physician with a valid license from the PRC can engage in telemedicine with patients physically residing in the Philippines. Okay. And then, what are the minimum competencies to practice telemedicine? We need digital communication skills, clinical acumen, and knowledge of technology and equipment to be used while adhering to ethical practice. So that is the position of the PPA at the staff for telepsychiatry during the pandemic. So why do I mention this? Because actually, the OWA, so the Overseas Worker, Overseas Workers Administration partnering with like the national. So for any of our colleagues, if uh, stories to share, you're very late in the open forum because sometimes these are referred and apparently some of our OFWs are seen online. Okay, so this is the position of the psychiatrists locally. Next slide, please. What about colleagues who also do therapy online? Psychologists, so this is their guide in conducting psychology during the pandemic. Also a 2020 document, it states that only registered and licensed psychologists are allowed to provide counseling and psychotherapy. So we have to make sure that we have a valid license to intervention. So if you'll notice, both, uh, both guidelines of leave us a bit of such licenses are valid in the, and for the patients actually have to physically be in the Philippines. And in, uh, and, Recalling our question a while ago, it actually makes uh, our poll question a while ago, sorry. It also makes no mention about where we, as the caregivers, as the mental health care workers, quote unquote, should be to our telepsychiatry. So uh, just something to think about. Okay, next slide, please. So I think all of us have. Well, not all of us. I think a lot of us have also experienced escorting a, escorting a patient in distress from another country back to the Philippines because they are being repatriated. Or some of us have experienced receiving a patient who has been repatriated. They just walk into our emergency rooms or our clinics because they just come home from a stressful OFW situation. Okay, so on site in the host countries, 
providing ko social support is also part of the services that the teens provides for its migrant workers. So, in COFW, in distress, for example, one with psychosis, it is complicated to be able to escort them through immigration, but there are staff members assigned there. Okay, so they are called the assistance to nationals staff members. And since it is complicated, it's important that they are trained to do that and that there are enough of them. The trend is actually going ever higher for overseas Filipino workers who are in distress. If we're talking about actual data, how many OFWs have mental illnesses, if you'll notice, I wasn't able to provide any such data because as of this 2020 study, there is none. So hopefully, hopefully uh, by now, uh, reports are coming or studies are being done. So let's see about that. And then next, it is also best to have a bilateral labor agreement with the host country. So between the Philippines and the host country so that we're able to bring in more teams to augment the service providers in for OFWs in the host countries and also to provide medications to OFWs in distress. So going back to the case, and for some of us, going back to our own practice, going back to our own clinics, we see our patients, even if they're in another country, but if they need medications, we have a difficult time getting the medications to them since our licenses are not valid there, so our prescriptions are also not recognized there. So, so even, even the OWA has the same problem that we do. Okay, so as mentioned earlier, no, our colleagues from the National Center of Mental Health are able to provide online services under the host country's regulations. Then also, uh, the psychiatrists are also in a good position to to give the embassy and the consulate general staff psychological first aid training so that there is further capacity building and that there are more people who are able to support the mental health of our OFWs. Next slide, please. All right. So after being repatriated, what are the services that are available for for the newly arrived OFWs, all right? So there, there is a psychosocial assistance. So that includes a halfway house where they can stay for a maximum of two weeks while they get their bearings. However, it's really important to have uh, good referral systems for any services that may be needed. Okay, what else? I wasn't able to place here since it, since it did not directly deal with mental health, although I believe that it is one of our determinants of mental health. Uh, it's very important to also be able to give employment opportunities if there are any locally. All right, so what else? Going back, it's important to have a referral system so that nobody drops the ball in terms of supporting the OFWs. So, Manageable cases, these were not clearly defined, no? They are referred to OWA, while the severe cases are referred straight to mental health institutions. So the star of this study is actually the National Center for Mental Health. So that's really great work that they're doing. It's also important to be able to give the newly arrived OFWs debriefing, stress debriefing, and of course, an initial consult if that's what they need. However, uh, problems come up when our returned OFWs have late onset symptoms because services outside Metro Manila are not as accessible. Okay, next slide, please. So after repatriation, after local services, reintegration is important. So again, socioeconomic reintegration includes uh, loans, pangkabuhayan showcase, employment opportunities, and it's very important also for foreign recruitment agents 
both public and private to report quarterly if there are any problems or incidents. This is very important because we don't have data and we're not going to be able to provide help or enact any policies or programs if we don't know what the problems are. The, however, we're not able to get this sort of data because the recruitment agencies also have apprehensions about reporting because their licenses might get revoked. Okay. What else is important? Suicide cases. So more specifically, especially for seafarers, uh, out at sea, the most common method is actually to jump off the ship. So a lot of the time, bodies are not recovered. So uh, a description was they disappear at sea, quote unquote, but uh, it looks like nothing really more conclusive is being reported. Okay, next slide. So, with these findings, what are the recommendations? workshops pre-deployment pre to involve the families who are left behind because it is not just our OFWs who have left who bear mental health consequences but the families left behind as well. Of course, it's important to curb the trafficking of minors so improve the civil registry, the birth certificates and there's a proposal to use bone age and dental records so that uh, we're able to prove the majority or the minority of the future OFW. It's also important to increase the pool of professionals. So uh, there was mention in this part about tying up with psychiatry and psychology training institutions. Then it's important to have a set interagency referral system from re repatriation to reintegration. So again, again, no one drops the ball when it comes to taking care of the OFWs. And this is actually my personal favorite, uh, a bilateral labor agreement. So again, help after OFWs abroad and also give us a chance to supply the needed medications for our OFWs. Next slide, please. So it's all and have like a counseling system and to consider expanding to telemedicine for cases in need of immediate medical attention. Then, of course, for the agencies that serve migrants, we should be able to develop psychosocial counseling competencies so that, again, again, that the delivery of mental health support is not restricted to mental health specialists, especially since there are so few of us. It's also important to monitor the mental health of distressed returning Filipinos if they are reintegrated with their families. Then, it's also important to shift the focus of the mental health service package not only to OFWs, but also to marriage migrants and the families left behind. Then lastly, it's important to strengthen accessibility and availability of mental health services at the community level so that the care is sustained even after, after uh, the OI is able to deliver the reintegration phase services, which is in alignment with the aim of universal health care, which was discussed by Attorney Beltran a while ago. So there, that's it for my thoughts and feelings regarding this case. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Dr. De La Liana, uh, we've heard a lot and uh, very good points that were raised already. And uh, for the interest of time, we'd like now to dive into uh, the open forum. Uh, um, we have several questions already in our uh, uh, Q&A box, so please keep them coming. And I do believe that uh, we ha actually have uh, members of our ethics committee. Uh, we'd like to invite you to some of your thoughts later if if uh, you can. And uh, there's also an invitation earlier to say something more about uh, 
uh, migrant workers, uh, OFWs, or people residing abroad, uh, particularly those who are caring for uh, OFWs through the NCMH. So if anyone uh, from the institution would like to also say something, please feel free to also uh, uh, do that later on. But uh, right now, I'd like to invite back Dr. Carrasco, Dr. De La Liana, and Attorney Beltran to open your videos. And uh, we'll now uh, try to answer the questions. And I'll try to uh, compress some of them or put together questions that are uh, similar. Uh, or would have uh, would like to address a particular uh, the same point. So let me start by asking uh, a question from Dr. Micheline Buot and an anonymous attendee. So if the husband is in the Philippines and despite all psychoeducation explanations to him, uh, refuses to still have the wife admitted, but the family and the consultant sees the need to have the patient admitted, who is to be followed? So uh, a similar question uh, goes, like this if the husband were filipino and refused treatment in in admitting the patient and admission for a patient what rights do the parents and siblings have in their desire to admit the patient so it's like the husband versus the patient's family so um dr carrasco perhaps uh, would like to start uh yes i think uh, this is actually the situation that happened with the case prior to her admission to pgh <laughs> uh the husband uh signed uh, a waiver uh for the patient to be sent home against medical advice so in that sense that is really what will happen the patient will be um uh, sent home with the husband because he is at that point in time um in the order of the ability to be to give consent he uh, has priority over the parents. And I think the uh, attorney will be able to expound on that as well. Um, so in that case, if that is what happens, then the husband will be will be the one taking the patient home. Okay. Um, yes, attorney. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Carrasco. Uh, maybe yes. attorney would like to say something also. Uh -oh. Just take note that the um, uh, consent of the uh, other um persons or the, the, the um, persons indicated will only be obtained if the patient herself uh, cannot give the consent no so but if the patient um in uh gave her consent no, to be admitted even despite the objection of the husband the patient's um uh, decision will prevail now uh what if in the case that the, the patient cannot give a, a, a an informed consent and uh, the husband uh, despite uh, all those um, uh, information given to, to him uh, refuses we have to find out first uh, what is the reason for objection because sometimes uh, we have to to, to to make to ensure that the consent is not unreasonably withheld so we have to find out uh, is the husband um, reasonab unreasonably withholding the uh, the consent uh, for any for for um, for some reason. So we have to take note of that also because um, uh, again uh, one of the exceptions no in securing the consent if it will put the patient um, life and limb at risk. So the physician will now. Um, or the hospital uh, may now um, uh, proceed with the procedure, especially if there is an imminent death or imminent loss of life. No, so even uh, with the objection of the husband, the, um, uh, the the welfare of the patient will be taken into consideration. No, that's why you have to. Um, um, uh, we will not uh, depending on the situation while the uh, um, the husband has the legal right the legal spouse has the legal right to uh, make decisions for the other spouse but take into consideration the uh, the, the condition of the patient also take into consideration so 
Thank you very much, uh, Attorney. There are um, several questions now related to, uh, I think, the patient's capacity to give informed consent. Uh, I mean, we, we'll reserve them for a while, but we'll follow the, the thread here, like the family or the husband giving consent, and uh, who do we uh, uh, recognize or honor? There's a question related to um, the LGBTQ uh um, population. Uh, so people who uh, are in this situation uh, would probably have a different, I, I don't know, given the, the limitations in our current laws. No? So thank, uh, from an anonymous attendee, thank you for this interesting discussion. What if the Filipino LGBTQ is legally married outside the Philippines to a Filipino or other race? Uh, who would be the point person uh, if the scenario is between the spouse versus the service user's parent, like uh, I would understand, given that uh, the marriage in other countries is, is not recognized here in the Philippines. So, can you please comment on that? Okay. Uh, so, with all due respect uh, to our, to the LGBTQ, uh, we all know that um, same-sex marriage is not yet recognized here in the Philippines. And um, the uh, definition of spouse uh, under the family code is uh, very clear, man and wife, man and a woman, no? husband and wife, man and, uh, man and woman. So that, those are um, the family code no? uh, defines spouses are biologically meaning man and woman. So if in this case, uh, since um, uh, if a situation would call that a spouse, no, a patient could not give us uh, consent now. Um, we have to uh, to um, uh, get the consent of the parent, assuming no, that the uh, the patient is single. Uh, I mean, uh, doesn't have any children of legal age. So the next person who should give a consent uh, is either the parent either the parent. Thank you. So that's our current uh, situation right now. So, uh, yeah, that's um, okay. Let me now go back, uh, attorney, and uh, to um, the issue about giving consent because there are several that uh, uh, that uh, were raised already here. So, uh, for example, uh, this question from Dr. John Michael Reyes. Um, in situations of obtaining informed consent, is it the psychiatrist's job to determine competence to give informed consent, or is this something that can only be determined by a judge? The psychiatrist, so, yeah, the, the can, physician. Anyone, anyone can comment. Uh, sorry, the licensed physician, I think, um, is uh, competent to determine the competency or the health literacy of the patient no, to give the consent. So uh, with all the four elements, um, the uh, physician will be able to uh, to um, determine the um, the competency of the patient. So not necessarily the judge, not necessarily the judge. Okay, um, thank you, attorney. Uh, how about for cases like, uh, this was particularly uh, addressed to you, attorney, uh, for demented patients, we are tasked to appear in court uh, to assess them, especially with their rights to handle their finances and properties, etc. How do we protect ourselves, especially if the respondent is their attorney or the lawyer who took advantage of letting the elderly sign checks to her credit? No? And this is questions from Dr. Uh, uh, Bernadette Arsena. Mm, about the system, especially with their ah, it happened. Hi, Dr. Arsena. She's a good friend of mine, actually. <laughs> so, who took advantage of letting their design the checks? Uh, how do we protect ourselves, especially if the respondent is their attorney? Of course, now, uh, when you appear in court, you have to, you are considered as an expert witness. Precisely, the court no, calls you. Uh, you will take the witness stand because of your competency as a psychiatrist to determine the um, uh, mental capacity of the patient of the of the, the patient now um uh as to the lawyer um if there is a vitiated consent or if there uh is an instance wherein the um uh, the patient was uh, 
uh, forced to do, like uh, signing checks. Of course, uh, that has something uh, that is also a, a matter that to be addressed or to be uh, that the next of kin should be uh, should be informed about it. Um, unless, no, if if the uh, if the the lawyer is the um, um, the appointed guardian of the um, the uh, the ward uh, as, a, as as a psychiatrist, if there is a um, um, a, uh, a proof that the uh, lawyer is uh, uh, um, influencing or uh, getting the, uh, the the consent of the uh, the ward through through um, fraudulent means. Uh, I think the um, paramount no, uh, duty of the, uh, the, the 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 psychiatrist is to um, uh, tell the judge about it. To just about so you just be truthful in your testimony you now uh, in court you just have to be true because um, at that point in time when you are uh, take the witness stand you are considered an officer of the court not uh, even if the uh, the respondent was the one who called you to the witness stand or the lawyer called you to the witness stand your paramount duty is to the court not to the lawyer so you have to protect the uh, the uh, the ward from uh, from the uh, influences undue influences of the lawyer. So, thank you, um, attorney, uh, ma'am, babes, uh, doctor, said. Now, would like to thank you. Big thanks, uh, sis, attorney Shella for your insights. <laughs> she says in the Q and A box. So, um, uh, doctor Carrasco and uh, maybe attorney would also like to comment on this uh, question uh, or comment also, like. Good evening. What about patients who are admissible for uh, suicidality, mania, psychosis, etc.? But in short, uh, reason there's a reason for admission, but there's no uh, relative that can be contacted who can make decisions for these patients. Um, relatives who, who themselves are psychotic, or uh, I mean, the, or there are no relatives who can give the the consent. So, Doctor Kerasmi, you might want to start. Yes. So. Definitely the mental health professional, the licensed physician will be the one to uh, evaluate and as mentioned earlier, will be the one to uh, make this decision for admission. And again, uh, since there is no relative or there is no legal representative for this patient, then the doctor will be the one to uh, sign the consent. Thank you. How about uh, uh, attorney? Do you want to say something, by the way? Um, yes, if I may. Yes, I, I agree with Dr. Carrasco. And if I may, uh, I would encourage you know, our uh, psychiatrists or physicians to enlist the help you know, of the medical services. We have social workers uh, in the hospital and also the legal office because there are certain uh, it would be better if, if, if uh, uh, just to just to protect your back I mean so to speak now uh, so that all all um, uh, will be covered now legally and uh, so it would be better uh, to uh, ask the assistance of the social services because they will conduct a uh, social case study report uh, in, in uh, patients uh, like this no and the legal will can also help you in drafting or in preparing the necessary documents, not just the not just the inform, not just the informed consent, but other uh, pertinent documents also. This is will also protect you know, the, the 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 physician as well as the hospital. Thank you very much, attorney. Uh, how about um, advanced directives? Um, there's a question here about will an ad that goes will an advanced directive be beneficial for? Our patient here and would it be beneficial for mental health institutions also to do routine facilitation of advanced directives for, for, for patients who have similar circumstances where the spouse and family have different opinions about hospital admission um it says that uh it would solve further questions about hospital admissions and a good practice for training residents to keep in mind as well um do hospitals have existing guidelines for it already as far as we know um maybe we can comment on it or answer the question. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, having an advanced directive, a psychiatric advanced directive, which is a very specific legal tool that has been used in other countries, specifically in the US, Canada, and Europe, 
uh, it's very prevalent for use in mental health um, uh, service provision. However, here in the Philippines, even though there's provision in the Philippine mental health law for the use of advanced directives, there are no guidelines as yet, uh, as far as I know, uh, in terms of how this will be implemented. And as far as I know, in and I, I think attorney will be able to give light on this as well. Uh, what we use in current practice is the special power of attorney in assigning a legal representative. Uh, but I think that is a very good um, direction that we can go into, specifically because there are a lot of studies as well in Canada and Europe that show that uh, the use of psychiatric advanced directives can lead to uh, less readmission, can lead to better outcomes because it takes into consideration the patient's um, wishes and the patient's advanced directives leading to a better um, um, adherence to treatment and even um, better outcomes. So I, that's actually one of my uh, topics for my thesis. So uh, if you have any uh, input with that as well, I'd like to uh, get your uh, feedback. So there you go. That there Great. you need? Yes. Um, yeah. I in addition, uh, using the example of EB now, because initially she gave the consent and then eventually uh, due to some um, uh, result. So um, in those uh, instances where the patient can uh, uh, voluntarily gives consent, it is uh, um, uh, better to just uh, to um, have her execute you know, a document, Lord, a signing, a signing whoever should give uh, the consent or uh, give the, uh, the the decision um, in um, uh, cases or during the time that she cannot do it. She cannot do it. So uh, yeah, um, the, uh, uh, we have you know, several uh, documents, I mean, I mean, legal forms that can do that, not necessarily a special power of attorney. There can be a uh, uh, other forms also that can be added. And, um, you know, our, our uh, uh, the Filipinos are not yet that uh, uh, <laughs> open, uh, especially when it comes to like future um, uh, uh, medical conditions. No? So uh, it would be a good, uh, it would be a, a, a good uh, practice to uh, to uh, help now to uh, help patients make that um, uh, decision for themselves. Uh, so we can. That's the reason why. Um, please enlist the help of the legal office or any um, in those instances. It would be better that you at the at the earliest no, uh, opportunity, earliest uh, no, that you already seek the, the, the assistance of. Uh, the, the legal office of your institution. Thank you very much. Uh, we beg the indulgence of the audience here. Uh, we will answer last three questions here because there are there are several important questions that we'd like to really touch on, but uh, hopefully we will uh, not extend that too much. But uh, attorney, we would like to maximize the time with you here. So there's a question about foreign clients, like. Uh, being admitted uh, foreigners who are without relatives. So would the same principle apply, uh, Dr. Carrasco, Dr. Um, uh, and Attorney Beltran, or would you want to comment on this? What's the process? This is a question from Dr. Joselito Pascual. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Attorney. Yes. Um, yeah, this, this, this is actually a challenge now because we also have several instances in uh, PGH where there are foreigners uh, admitted now and um, uh, we don't they don't have any uh, relatives or uh, one instance is they came here just to meet their um, uh, yeah, new <laughs> girlfriends or so, so which under the, uh, who under the law cannot give consent <coughs> so um, uh, the 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 um, easiest way is actually to um, get in touch with the embassy, <coughs> uh, the the foreigner, to get um, to to enlist the help. But again, it depends on the conditions. No? If uh, the uh, foreigner 
uh, is needed for medical condition. Again, only the, the, the physician can uh, um, uh, can already um, do what is necessary under that under that circumstance. So, so um, hey, thank you. Uh, I agree with Dr. Tran, and that's what we have. We usually do, um, and in, for example, in um, for example, with the U.S. Embassy, they have a special office that attends to um, concerns um, of their uh, residents in our country or their citizens in our country. And so usually when we do contact them, they are the ones who can facilitate any uh, treatment. But as mentioned by Dr. Delaliana in the chat, usually they are within office hours. So it's usually in the wee hours of the night that we have these kinds of issues and dilemmas. And that's the time that we need to contact, as mentioned, our legal uh, department and our social services. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to request uh, Dr. Carrasco, there's a question related to advanced directives, especially for LGBTQ spouse, uh, may, or maybe, maybe even Dr. Delaliana, maybe you could just type your answer there because we don't have a lot of time. We'd, we'd like to request your uh, 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 help there. But I'd like to bring now the uh, shed light on and mention the issue on telemedicine. So I think this, many people ask about this. So um, I'll summarize it. Um, I guess some of us are actually seeing patients while out of the country or when our patients are out of the country, whether permanently or temporarily. Are there medical license issues given that we've heard already that that's not technically allowed per guidelines? So, um, yeah, what would be implications of this? And uh, maybe you want to comment on this, uh, Dr. De La Liana and uh, Attorney Beltran? Well, guidelines-wise, guidelines-wise, so there really are issues. Uh, an example offshore that I'd like to point out is, for example, the United States. So actually, per state, iba ang licensing laws nila. So, uh, if all of you remember the the course on telemedicine from the, the online course on telemedicine from Harvard that we, I think we all took anyway. But it don't nakasabi eh, you have to be licensed where your patient is to practice. Pero for us locally, no, the guidelines set by the PPA and the PAP, uh, yon, those are guidelines. So uh, technically, walang position as far as I know, ang ano eh, ang PRC. There are kinds of laws of learning already. So the next question is, is it ethical to deny care when we can give care to some extent? And to leave that question, I think Ernie Beltran will have a better, hopefully a better answer. Thank you, yes, Dr. Um, yes, attorney. Yeah, there's no national, I mean, I have mentioned, there's no uh, legislation yet pertaining to telemedicine or telehealth no, services. While uh, there are guidelines uh, issued by the DOH, but this, again, as Dr. Yana said, these are just guidelines now. Um, while uh, the uh, uh, it is, uh, as is stated in the guidelines, only licensed physician um, uh, can um, um, engage in telemedicine for patients residing in the Philippines. However, um, the um, uh, again, I would also agree with the um, uh, position of Dr. Liana. Are you? The ethical consideration or the moral, actually, the moral question, especially physician and patient are founded on mutual trust and confidence. No? So, um, and that is very important because when the patient uh, already have the trust, has the trust and confidence on the, on the, the physician, she will open up. No? She will be able to, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Ask for the, the for the help. So while there is no um, uh, law prohibiting um, 
licensed physician here in the Philippines to um, conduct telemedicine globally, again, um, that will also be subject to the laws no, where the, uh, the, 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 the uh, patient is at the moment. Now, um, only be violation to uh, claims or suit no, if the patient uh, himself would file a case like, for example, data privacy, violation of data privacy, those things. But I would, my position is there's no, there's no prohibition for licensed physician residing here in the Philippines to conduct telemedicine of patients abroad, although subject to uh, the uh, require to the, the, the policy of the, uh, the the country where the state uh, where the patient is residing, and of course, um, uh, and, and then, unless and until there's a law. Uh, punishing certain acts of um, or, or uh, certain violations pertaining to telemed telemedicine, there can be no crime. So uh, there, we have a principle in criminal law that there is no crime when there is no law punishing it. So, uh, there, there are pending, there are several pending bills in the Congress for telemed telemedicine and telehealth, but until then, um, uh, we can only be guided now by the issue once of uh, the OH. So I think I, it, I would take this opportunity to encourage now the Philippine Psychiatric Association to lobby, uh, to really lobby for the enactment, now, the passage of this telemedicine act. It has been long pending in, 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 in the Congress now, and it's high time that this legislation should become a law. And uh, we, we need uh, lobbying. So um, who would better uh, lobby for this uh, legislation but uh, the Philippine Psychiatric Association, Psychological Association, the Philippine Medical Association. So, um, Thank you so much. We will, we will take note and we will uh, definitely bring it up to our leaders here in PPA. Uh, they are hearing it now. So last question, attorney, for uh, for you. Uh, because you mentioned uh, a few things about apostille document. Uh, if it's an emergency, is there an option? Uh, uh, is there an alternative? Because it takes weeks, uh, several weeks, as an anonymous attendee mentioned here in our Q and A box. So what would be our alternative? A written, a written uh, document, a written in, uh, document to that effect, and um, duly signed, no, by the uh, um, is is an, uh, is acceptable. It's acceptable. So the um, if the document would affect you no know, third parties or would there would there would be leg legal consequences of the um, uh, the um, uh, documents, it is actually um, important that it be apostilled, you no know, like special power of attorney and other document uh, documents that would um, give you know, uh, rights. To the uh, to the attorney in fact or to whoever is, but a written you know, uh, document duly signed by the um, um, by the principal is I, I I would I would uh, say that that would be sufficient. That would be sufficient. No? Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Beltran, uh, Doctor Carrasco, Doctor De La Liana. Uh, we also thank everyone for being patient and for really participating well. Uh, we know we're extending here, but uh, we'd like to hear first before we finally wrap up our open forum uh, from uh, our ethics committee in the PPA. Uh, I think uh, uh, they can also answer the question like, do we have a PPA ethical practice guideline for common encounter scenarios? I know. Uh, we they had the project recently that we that was launched and uh, we'd like to hear Dr. Uh, Lysel Trinidad Fulhensho, ma'am. Uh, you want to say something, Pa? Yes. Um, thank you very much for uh, this evening's activity. First off, no, many of you will wonder that for this scientific committee, uh, this scientific meeting, it's the the topic is quite different, no. So the reason for that is because. Uh, on behalf of the PPA Committee on Ethics, headed by Dr. Ravinus Arain, we would actually would like to thank the UPPGH for graciously accepting our request 
to have a collaboration with them in today's scientific meeting. No? So yun po yung reason why our discussion for tonight is focused on the ethical principles. No? So if you notice, this is also the committee's first attempt for this year to integrate ethical issues and concerns in the cases presented during the scientific uh, meetings. And because this is part of the committee's plan to provide educational opportunities for members of the PPA and to heighten awareness on a range of ethical topics pertinent to healthcare and the clinical practice of psychiatry. No? Kaya po ganito yung topic for tonight. No? Uh, as for Joff, no? thank you very much, Joff, for and the rest of the, the, the PGH community po, for bringing this up. Actually po, uh, when I was hearing about uh, the questions raised, no, definitely may work na naman that will be done on the ethics committee part. No, what we have to answer, Joff. So far, what we have done is actually uh, to put into play the implementing guidelines for uh, the members of the committee in terms of the core room. No, how to address. Uh, some of the concerns and then if there are concerns for ethical breaches no uh we will be uh releasing a book on that i think uh it's it will be launched sometime in january but for guidelines whether we can practice telemedicine uh for for patients of ours no in other countries we have yet to have that guidelines yet no so wala pa po uh, but it's a good thing no, that we will be working on probably a lot of other committees from the PPA will also be involved. No? So thank you for this very insightful lecture. And thank you also and looking forward to more collaborations with other training institutions. Salamat po. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Trinidad Falhensho, Ma'am Lysel. Uh, thank you also to our uh, ethics committee. And thank you to all our speakers. And uh, now we'll be wrapping up. So we'd like uh, to call now um, our uh, very own uh, PPA uh, Secretary, Dr. Uh, Joanne May perez Rifarial, and the FPPA to uh, give uh, the certificate, to award the certificate. Dr. Rifarial. Hello, thank you very much, Joff. Good evening, PPA. It is my honor to present the following certificates of appreciation to our host institution, speakers, and pharmaceutical partner for tonight's activity. So the certificate reads, the Philippine Psychiatric Association, Inc. presents this certificate of appreciation to the University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital, for having rendered a valuable contribution as host institution on the topic best and brightest, exhibiting exemplary expertise on the topic ethics and the law in psychiatry, challenges for patient care, held today, March, May 16, 2023, via Zoom. So these, this is signed by our PPA president, Dr. Robert D. Buenaventura, FPPA Live, Alive, <laughs> our vice president and chair of the PPA Committee on Psychiatric Education, Arnold Angelo M. Pineda, FPNA, FPPA, and myself as the board secretary. Thank you very much and congratulations, UP PGH. The same certificate is awarded to our very good moderator, Joffrey Sebastian E. Kering, MD, MPH, MSRHS, FPPA, for having rendered a valuable contribution as moderator. Thank you very much, Joff. You're welcome. The, sa <laughs> the same certificate is awarded to Dr. Maria Andrea G. Carrasco, FPPA, for having rendered a valuable contribution as our one of the speakers for tonight. Another certificate is, is awarded to attorney Sheila Marie M. Beltran for her valuable contribution as tonight's speaker as well. And the same certificate is also awarded to Dr. Victoria Patricia C. De La Liana, FPPA, for her valuable contribution also as our speaker for tonight. So thank you very much to all of our speakers and congratulations. And last but not the least, this certificate is awarded to VEXA Life 
their valuable contribution as our pharmaceutical partner and sponsor for tonight's activity. Maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Dr. Referial. Now we'd like to hear from our sponsor, Vexa Life Sciences. We'd like to call um, Ella Jean Cornejo, the business unit head of uh, Vexa Life Sciences. Good evening, doctors. To our speaker, good evening to the Philippine Psychiatric Association Board of Directors and members, and to the UPPGH Department of Psychiatry, who is the host of tonight's scientific meeting. I'm Ella Jen Cornejo, the business unit head 